so after the 2005 criteria came out, uh, and each of these criteria have always had the caveat that there be no better diagnosis. It's been every diagnostic criteria for multiple sclerosis going back, I don't know how far now, has always had that caveat because dissemination and time dissemination in space is characteristic of multiple sclerosis, but not unique to multiple sclerosis. Uh, and so after the 2005, there was from the community uh, sort of a hue and cry saying, well, enough of this caveat, uh, give us some guidelines. And that led to a, a 2008 paper. Uh, the lead author was, was David Miller from your institution, Wallace, um, that amongst other things, uh, provided some very useful differential diagnosis information in the form of charts uh, that had uh, a high probability, medium probability, low probability, of red flags of things that should be watched for, that if you see those, then you ought to rethink your diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, independent of whether someone fulfilled these criteria or not. That was published in the Multiple Sclerosis Journal in December of 2008, but had interesting things like um, a red flag if you have a persistently enhancing lesion. Uh, one ought to think of something else. If you have joint disease concomitantly or skin rashes or things of that sort, that one ought to think of something else. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, that was already 12 years ago. Do you see it? You think you see a need to update those? You know, I do think there might be a real value to readdress that. For example, we are pretty routinely now in first attack checking for IgG to aquaporin 4 and IgG to MOG, uh, particularly in, in the optic neuritis transverse myelitis. But if we're trying to define the MOG antibody associated syndrome, then I, I think it's reasonable to do that, although we might have a debate about that. I do think there would be some help in a reanalysis of what might be recommended evaluations and workups for ruling out other conditions. I agree entirely with what Patricia said, but I'd also highlight that in recent years, it's become clear that the conditions that are most likely to be mistaken for multiple sclerosis and multiple sclerosis is likely to be misdiagnosed are actually other quite common conditions. For example, migraine, functional neurological disorders, non-specific white matter lesions on MRI that you might see in people with vascular disease, for example. So I think while it's helpful to emphasize the, the rare or the less common conditions that can mimic multiple sclerosis, actually all neurologists should be vigilant to the fact that actually common neurological disorders can, can also be included in the differential diagnosis of MS. So this has actually become something that developed more concern about it. And, and when we were doing the 2017 criteria, we spent a reasonable amount of time talking about this concern of a misdiagnosis. And there have been a number of, of good papers on this over the last several years, highlighting what you said, Wallace, that there was common things and uh, migraine and, and vascular disease and psychiatric disease and such like that. And one of the big drivers of the error was misapplying the MRI criteria. And I think that, you know, they've been laid out, for example, that a paraventricular lesion ought to touch the ventricle and, and, and the, the juxtacortical lesions should touch the cortex, if not included entirely, and things like that. Not because MS can't produce lesions that don't do that, but because the basis of the criteria was on lesions that did do that. And they also re-emphasized the size, three millimeters or greater. Yeah. So, so misdiagnosis was an issue. And then almost shockingly, when one looked at how the misdiagnosed patients were treated, they were treated quite aggressively um, with disease-modifying therapies, which we're all happy to use in patients with MS, but not so happy to see them used in patients who don't have MS. Since we have the new definition of the criteria with all these um, items you already mentioned, do you still think that we have a high percentage of misdiagnosed patients? I suspect we do. Um, I haven't seen it updated in the last year, uh, 
Um, uh, but I, you know, the, part of the problem is that you know, when you write these criteria, we've made them easier and easier to do. Yeah. Uh, but the downside of easier criteria uh, are that they could be more easily misapplied. And the statistics on, on the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value and the accuracy all come from highly qualified MS centers. But our intention for the criteria is that they be used by all clinicians who are going to be diagnosing multiple sclerosis. And, th and that's where the problem comes in. But I think even more than clinically, I think the MRI misinterpretation uh, is most troublesome. 